pediatricians here, and it's good to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. And um, you know, th this is really our support group, right? This is really a national supervisor support group. So I always like to take a little time in the beginning if anybody has anything they want to share with the group. Any, you got something? No, we're just oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Any, you know, new hints, recipes, activities, anything that you want to share, anything that's worked for you or that you enjoy? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been going to um, the class that was um, sort of advertised here that's for... Yeah, um, Fit Fall Prevention with Ann and Yeah, Nancy. at, uh, at the Center for... Um, yes. um, um, senior independence. Yeah, Independent Living. Independent yeah. Living, right. And it is so great. You know, if yes. anybody yeah. has, um, you know, the time and, and needs some really good instruction, these are two retired physical therapists, and they, they give their time. They put together a big notebook. They are fantastic. So mm -hmm. it's great. Yeah, go up again. Wonderful. Yes. Second and third. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've been going to Jim's class. I guess between two and three years now. He is a great instructor. He's wonderful. I highly recommend it. All right. Yeah. That well, introduction. Hopefully you all find that out in the <laughs> next next hour or so. Well, um, so I guess I get to introduce Jim Moulton. He is here today to talk to us about Tai Chi. He is a Tai Chi instructor as well as a Chai Kwong. Gong. Qigong. 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 <laughs> Qigong. <laughs> and that uh, he does teach right next door. We can see his uh, the Winter Park Presbyterian Church right out the window. So, and now, I am just so delighted. Last night I got in the mail with, uh, uh, you know, an article that's called Up to Date. But anyway, in, um, in September, JAMA, Internal Medicine, there was an article that looked at Tai Chi that's quite significant. Because tai Chi is more effective than balance and strengthening exercises for fall prevention. Um, they did a study out in Oregon with 670 adults. The average age was 78. They were mainly Caucasian women. But they had the, um, the participants exercise an hour twice a week for six months. And there were three different groups. One group did Tai Chi. One group did what they called multimodal exercise. And that incorporates strengthening, aerobic training, balance training, and flexibility exercises. And then the third group simply did stretching. And they found a significant um, at six months, the Tai Chi group experienced significantly fewer falls than the multimodal group and the control group. 11 versus 16 falls um, and 27 falls. So basically, Tai Chi, out of uh, 100 persons per month, the Tai Chi group only had 11 falls, the multimodal 16, and then the control that just did the stretching was 27. So, and there were no adverse events. Uh, with the intervention. So it is now thought that the multimodal, multimodal exercise intervention has been commonly accepted standard for fall prevention. These, re these results suggest that Tai Chi is actually superior. So that's a that wonderful, yeah, that's a, a wonderful, <laughs> a wonderful <laughs> testimonial for me. So I'm going to turn this off, and I do, I just want to go, he, um, Jim has a wonderful website, but um, I'm going to turn this off for now. And um, Jim, if you want to open those windows in the back. So that we can have full light in here. Does it do it automatically? No, nope, I have to do that. Ah. <laughs> so it is, is my turn to speak. So yes. I do usually have my class where it's about 80% exercising, 20% I talk as we're doing it. So there's an education that goes along with it. In this setting, I get to flip it around. It's going to be about 80% of me talking and explaining. We'll do about 20% worth of exercises. So I actually get to like, like talk and not feel guilty that you're not moving. But I will get you moving too. So what I would really like to do to just kind of get us on the same page right off the bat, instead of me talking a real lot, I want you to do a breathing exercise. Because what that'll do, it will relax you. It will relax me, because I'm speaking. And it'll get us kind of in the frame of mind of being receptive to me using these, these uh, white erase boards to kind of convey some points what we're going to do. So I have a chair. I think where they're at is fine, because most people, you don't need to squint to see what I'm doing. It's going to be more direction and listening. So what I would like you to try and do, and this is one of the first exercises we do like in my regular classes, but 
maybe just in a different setting because we're sitting down. I would like you to move a bit towards the end of the chair so we're not in the habit of being you know, on the backrest. This will make us sit a little bit straighter. So look where your thighs are at. I'm a pretty tall person, so my knees are a little bit high. I want my knee to be at least level with my hip, maybe even a little bit lower. So I end up putting my feet out in front of me. If you're somewhat shorter, you know, you're going to be back here and your legs are going to be down and you're going to maybe, you know, be touching the ground anyway. So anyway, so that just kind of makes our lower body kind of relaxed. Turn your palms up, shrug your shoulders, let your shoulders drop. If you're comfortable with closing your eyes, close your eyes. Otherwise, leave them open, but don't strain to look at what we're doing because we're not going anywhere for the next minute or two. So I'm going to inhale through my nose, exhale through the mouth. Deep breath. Inhale, in through the nose, out through the mouth. So I only need to open my mouth maybe about an eighth or a quarter of an inch at most to let that breath out. It doesn't have to be like my mouth is moving to exhale. Inhale. Exhale. So if that's all fine, when you inhale, squeeze your tongue up to the roof of your mouth. When you exhale, let the tongue drop to the bottom of your mouth. So again, tongue doesn't need to move a whole lot. It's not like we're speaking. I'm speaking as we're doing this, but the tongue just needs to go up to the roof and then drop off the roof of the mouth. So everybody's still breathing deep. Even if I'm not telling you to breathe, you're still breathing deep on your own, right? So again, inhale through your nose. Exhale through your mouth. So if you're comfortable with doing that, when you exhale, try to squeeze your stomach. You can even put your, th your hand on your, your navel so that you can feel your stomach move. So when I inhale, my navel moves out. When I exhale, I pull or squeeze the stomach muscle back. Inhale, relax your stomach. Exhale, squish your stomach. So for some of you, that's going to be weird. That's an uncomfortable way of breathing. So why don't you open your eyes and sit however comfortable you want for a moment here. So what happens as we get older, we breathe more and more shallow because we're talking. Sometimes we're eating and talking. We're getting into you know, whatever's the, the topic at hand, and we're not really thinking about our breathing. We just assume that we're breathing deep and comfortably. But really, it starts to inch up until we're doing chest breathing, that whole bottom two-thirds really doesn't get that much movement. So to squish your stomach is good to help draw the diaphragm down so you take deeper breaths. And then there's a whole bunch of other benefits that come from that. Your heart's actually being kind of massaged as your diaphragm moves. Um, stomach muscles are all squishing around with the other organs. So there's many benefits to this. So hopefully everybody's a little bit relaxed. We just did one breathing exercise to get started. So now I can stand up and start to talk. And hopefully you're more receptive because you're more relaxed and you have something to think about with what we're doing here. So, I like to use these, these uh, whiteboards a little bit if they're available to me. So, hello, <laughs> thanks for coming. Jim Moulton, that's how you pronounce my name. So to give you a little bit of background, I'm gonna find the eraser. I started doing all this stuff when I was about 16 years old. I wanted to learn how to defend myself, so I signed up at a martial arts school. And then for the next couple of years, it was all about fitness and martial arts training. And then you know, I started to realize, hey, I can get in pretty good shape doing this. And my parents' health was pretty poor. My father's was extremely poor, very um, addictive atmosphere. He smoked, he drank, he didn't eat well. So I went the other direction. I hung out at the martial arts school, and I learned as much as I could. And I realized, hey, this is really good for your health. So as I kept getting older, the focus kind of changed. I started doing it more for my health and well-being and stress relief and not so much the martial end of it. So I spent about 10 years doing that aspect of it, learning martial arts and learning how to teach other people at the, at the student level. The next 10 years, I started to learn how to teach other teachers. And we started doing that where we had schools and we'd teach martial arts and fitness and wellness, stress relief. And then those instructors would learn to teach people. And then I had kids. Kids came, I said, you know, I really can't be doing this full time at a school and it's just a little too much for the schedule. So I made the decision with my wife, I would stay home and work from home. So I'm a graphic artist. I do all these charts that you see some of the artwork. I'm a martial artist and I'm also a photographer. 
So these things kind of all came together for me. So then while I was raising my kids, I had these windows of opportunity where I could go out and teach. So Winter Park Hospital, right across the street, had me doing a class for a couple of years there. The same type of stuff. And then they did some remodeling. I lost my space. They said, you got to go. You got six months to a year to find a new place. So one of my members was at Winter Park Presbyterian Church. So that's where I ended up. And I've been there for like the last 18 or 19 years teaching these classes. So I'm going to erase this because you guys don't need to know that part anymore. This eraser is not real good. So I want to give you a little bit of history. There we go. My magic eraser worked better. What is Qigong in Tai Chi? Anybody know? There's movement. There's an actual definition to what this stuff is. Uh, now I get one that doesn't work. That's why I brought a whole bunch of them. Let's pronounce it and spell that chi. That's air in Chinese. Gong. My writing's going to be terrible because, you know, this isn't like I'm writing on a piece of paper. It means work. Um, qigong is air work or breathing exercises. Um, many different ways to interpret it, but basically that's what it comes down to. So I'm going to erase this again. Get rid of the qigong. I'm going to draw a tree. We have roots. We have a stalk. We have branches. If I had a green marker, I put some leaves up there. That's the leaves. So what's the object of the tree? Where does all this stuff come from? Qigong is basically yoga, just a different interpretation of it. Goes back to about 1,500 years, maybe to 3,300 years BC. That's when yoga came about. They didn't call it yoga, they called it whatever at the time, just, hey, go do this. This is what we're doing. Qigong was the same thing energy, breathing work is what I had spoke about previously. They didn't start calling it Qigong until maybe the last hundred years or so. It's like now you look it up and it's like, oh, Qigong's only been around 100 years. No, because it goes back to being part of yoga. So then there was this famous guy named Damo, who was a um, Buddhist monk, practiced yoga. He said, I'm going to go to China and teach. That was around the 4th to 5th century. He went to go teach the Chinese. He came across the temples. These guys were meditating. They were very unhealthy, their bodies, because they were not doing any physical movement. So he showed them a bunch of exercises, which were Qigong or yoga. And it's like, oh, we can weaponize this. Now they have people that are very healthy moving their bodies and they're learning martial skills. So the Asian martial arts came about at that same time. Asian MA martial arts, in the fourth to fifth century. So then years passed, you know, a lot of fighting going on, but also people were learning how to develop their health and to be, you know, mentally strong, physically strong. So then a couple more centuries went by and we came across Tai Chi. Tai Chi translates to the supreme ultimate. Supreme ultimate what? They're talking about the energy again. Qigong, breathing work. Supreme ultimate is a different way of expressing it. And this was basically the same as Qigong and yoga, except it was in motion, it's moving the body. So we were just sitting in a chair. I would call that sitting Qigong. If we stood up and would start to do it, that would still be Qigong, but maybe with a little bit more movement if we started to move our arms or legs with it. So then, where did this come about? This was about the 12th century AD. It's been around a couple hundred years, at least as far as history is written. Then this other thing was taught and developed called Bagua. Oh, spelled it wrong. B A. G U A. And that is a figure eight. So it's exercises that are based upon, there's a little yin yang symbol in the center, um, the figure eight and moving in a circle 
around the, the figure eight. And that was about how to walk and how to twist the body. So Tai Chi and, and Bagua, very similar type exercise, just a different way of going, getting there. This came about somewhere between the 16th and the 19th century AD. So why is this important to have some history here? Because whenever we start talking about Qigong, Tai Chi, um, Bagua, most people don't even know about that, it, it's like this is new stuff, this is new, new age, alternative medicine. No, it's ancient. It's been around for a very long time, and that's where the credibility comes from. It's not just me doing it. Okay, I started when I was 16, I'm 54, that's 37, 38 years. That's my credibility. I'm in okay shape. These guys, wow, it goes, goes back all the way before Christ. <laughs> And it still works as people are still learning about it and still teaching it. So that's a little bit of the history lesson of where these exercises came about. It's not something I made up. It's not something other people just figured out. You know, hey, this is a great thing we should be doing. It's been around for a long time. It's, test, it's been proven with the test of time. So we're going to move away from the history part. And if you're comfortable doing some exercises, we're going to do it like right where you're at. You can come away from the chairs a little bit. If you need a little help with balance, if balance might be an issue, maybe move to the back side of the chair so you can, you can use that. Okay? It's not going to be anything you have to do. If you want to do it, then we'll stand up and do it. All right? So stand up. You need a little bit of space amongst yourselves. Usually when I'm at the uh, church, we're in the fellowship hall, and I ask everybody to put their arms out this way, front and back. We don't have that much room. All right, so I'm going to ask you to maybe stagger. You know, you can go one up, one back. That'll give you a little bit of space. Yeah, this isn't like a, uh, a rigid format right now. If you just walk five feet to your left because there's an open space, that's fantastic. There's no assigned seating or anything like that. So, All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you again Qigong because we're in somewhat of a limited space. It doesn't require us to move a whole lot. All right, so what we're going to do, we're going to rate, let's go with this one. We're going to raise our arms up in front as if our arms are floating. And then our arms are going to come down. All right, so just like what I had shown you a moment ago with the breath, I'm going to inhale through my nose as my arms float up. I'm going to exhale through my mouth as I come down. So did anybody figure out yet that you need to adjust your space because you're putting your hands in someone's face? If that's the case, just you know, say excuse me and then, then move over. So you know, we're, we're, we're all friends now, right? We're all in the same room together with this, right? So what I'm going to try and do now, when, I, when my arms float up, I'm going to lift my heels off the ground slightly. Arms come down, feet go flat. So we're getting used to what our balance is a little bit on our ball of our foot. So I inhale, heels come up. Exhale, hands come down. So some of you are moving very rigid, like you're lifting your shoulders, your arms come up, you come down. Kind of like you're, you're weightlifting or doing some kind of calisthenics, right? This is kind of opposite of that. We're trying to be more relaxed, more uh, loose and connected. So as my arms come up, relax. Let your wrist, elbow, and shoulder bend. Let the heel come up. Let the wrist, elbows, and shoulders bend as we come down. All right. So if that's all fine, I'm going to sometimes point or do things. That's what I mean. You need to move your hand that way. I'm going to move my chin up when I inhale. That's going to make my lower back arch slightly. When I come down, I bend my chin down slightly. That's going to make my shoulders and my back round a bit. So my chin, where my head goes, kind of directs where the spine goes. All right. So my arms are going to come up. Chin goes up. Inhale. Exhale, come down. Some of you are going to be a little challenged with the balance. So I try to come all the way up to the ball of my foot. And then down. So again, if you need to, you grab a chair. Or you don't lift quite as high. So what this is going to do, it's going to start to give you a little more um, feel for where your balance is. Maybe your balance is fantastic and you, you know, this is like no problem. Others, it might be a little bit challenging. If you want to be a little more challenged, at the end we pick up our toes. So I'm going to come all the way up to the ball of my foot, and then flat, and pick up the toes for just a second, and then go flat again. So say you have to sit down. Balance isn't good. You need to sit down for a moment. You could be doing the same thing sitting in a chair, because my chin still makes my back either arch, or when my chin drops, my back rounds. We go in. 
we go out. All right, why don't we grab a seat for a moment so then I can explain what's going on here with this. And then this gives me a chance to move on to the next part of my uh, dry erase board. I really don't like that one. All right. So some of you felt your, your balance a little bit trying to, to do this thing. Some of you felt like you're tight, maybe your shoulders. So what we're trying to do really is to activate the three curves in our back. Why? Because if we're stiff in our back, our nerves are all connected into our spine, means that the spine is not that healthy, the nerves aren't that healthy either, as healthy as they could be, right? So with me doing this rolling, I get my back to arch, and then round. I just kind of get this wave going. So it's not real hard impact. You know, it's not like I'm saying bend down, touch your toes, grab your ankles, bring your nose to your knee. That's a whole different type of exercise. I do that too, but that's, that's different. This is more subtle. So your back starts to get more flexibility in a more subtle way. So now we need to talk about osteoporosis, because that's part of what bone health is, right, or lack thereof. There's different ways we can make our body get stronger as far as making our bones stronger. We have tension. Putting the body under some tension as if we were doing maybe weights. Um, elastic bands, some of you might have seen that, like at a health club. Tension, definitely yoga, putting your body under tension in some of the different positions. Um, treadmill, everybody's favorite type of exercise, standing somewhere but going nowhere, right? Um, <laughs> yard work, yard work puts tension on your body because depending upon what you're doing, Pushing a lawnmower, bending down, straightening up, reaching, use, you know, it's, it's, it's menial activity, manual menial activity. So that's a few different ways tension builds up strength. There's this very important thing that we call Wolf's Law. Does anybody know what Wolf's Law is? And it's nothing with uh, the wolf in the forest or any of that kind of stuff. Wolf was a... Uh, a German sur surgeon and anatomist, I guess you would call him. He studied anatomy. And he came about this um, theory that your body, especially the bones, when they're under stress or tension, they start to adapt. So if you lift a lot of weight, you know, your body gets stronger. But the bones get stronger and the muscles connecting, right? So that's Wolf's Law. So if we stand in this position here for five minutes, it's going to hurt. But after a few minutes, your body's going to say, hey, we're going to be here. We need to start getting some strength down there. So maybe just for that one time you do it, you get a little stiff or sore. You do it every day. You do weightlifting every day. Your body starts to get stronger from doing, doing this and being under that stress. So Wolf's Law kind of comes into play with keeping our body under tension. Or the next one would be impact. Impact might not be the friend for this, this group here. That would be running. You all like my penmanship, I can tell, right? Brisk walking, because regular walking would probably be on this side, right? Brisk walking puts you under a little bit more impact as your feet keep hitting the ground and it um, transcends up through the joints. Jumping rope. Who wants to jump rope for five minutes so you can build up your bones so that you can have a knee problem? Right? Hiking. Hiking is another form of impact exercise. Same thing. Some of these exercises might not give you the benefit you're looking for if you get injured in the process of trying to exercise. Here's, a, here's one of my favorites too, tennis. If you have weak bones, you should practice tennis. So your bones get stronger, but again, you'll blow out your knee and ankle or your back if you're over the age of 55. Right? I'm 54, so it's like, I don't have to worry about that yet. What were you going to say? Where would climbing stairs? <sighs> climbing stairs could be kind of in both. Because there's some impact every time you take your foot off the ground. But there's tension because as you're pushing up. So that's actually uh, like on both. Yoga could be on both because there are some things that might have impact. Even the Tai Chi, there is some impact if 
you're practicing it or you're taught that way. So a lot of these things are very much open to interpretation of the individual. If you're in good shape, you might be able to do something like jumping rope. If you're not, then you know, maybe uh, elastic bands would be something. You, know, you could put the elastic band between your ankles and you're pulling them apart. There's different levels of any of these things. Plus, there's who's teaching it to you. If you're learning it off to YouTube or out of a book, then it's in your mind how you're interpreting it. It's like, oh, this is really hard, or this is really easy because that's how you're interpreting it. What I try to do when I teach my classes is give many different levels of um, variety. It's like, if you can do this, oh, this is my 25-minute reminder to make sure that I don't run over and talking about one subject. I got another one that's going to go off at 12.55, which will be like time to ask questions. If anybody wants to stay after, then we, you know, if the room is still available, and I'll ask, answer questions. So anyway, I got to make sure I stay on task here. So anyway, does this all make sense? You know, it's like, which of these can you actually do that have adjustments? Weights, you can adjust how much, how little. Elastic bands, yoga, treadmill, you can increase or decrease the intensity. Yard work, walking, all of these over here you can kind of adjust. Running, yeah, you can run slower or faster, but pretty much if you're running and you have a knee problem, you're going to know about it. Um, jump rope, it's kind of, you know, either you're jumping the rope or you're not, you know. How do you do it lightly? Hiking, once you're out there, you got to make it back. You know, where are you going to go hiking around here? You go to Wakaiva State Park, and, you know, it's flat, so you might as well just be walking brisk in your neighborhood. Tennis, it's either you're kind of doing it or not. If you're, you're hitting the ball, you're not. So, again, Tai Chi, again, you can adjust what you're doing. So those are a couple of different things. Tension, impact. The third one, which people are starting to get more familiar with a little bit if they're either studying fitness or they have a bone issue, is vibration. Anybody hear about vibration for bones yet? Have you done it? Did you like it? Does it sound good? So you vibrate on a, uh, let's call it therapy, vibrating therapy. They have platforms, kind of like the old weight machine where you put it around your waist and it would jiggle the fat away. So the, this thing, you stand on it and it vibrates, and you either stand on it and try to have your body adjust, you know, to stay stable, or you hold on to the handle and, again, maintain some stability, or you can do exercises on it. Did they show exercises where you squat down or stand up or try to balance on one leg? A little bit. Yeah. So it's kind of neat. It's a little new wave, but the theory still goes back to the ancient stuff. And that if your body is under a certain amount of tension, like Wolf's Law, your body's going to adjust. The bones are going to get stronger. The muscles are going to adjust. So with therapy, I don't really, um, I'm not going to go out and buy one of those vibration things because I have my own methods to doing this. But there's also what we would call tapping. Tapping or creating our own vibration. And I've taught this in some of my classes before. I'm not going to go over it a whole lot today, but here's a couple of the different prop type items here. Um, seems kind of medieval or something. You actually tap the, the body. And those small little vibrations, again, increase the circulation, increase the blood flow. The bones respond to it. This is a bean bag filled with, um, I don't know what's in here. Pinto beans, garbanzo beans, the favorite bean of the week, whichever one. And you don't cook them, you don't eat them, you keep them dry, and you would do the same type of thing. So this requires a little more effort, a little more thought. You've got to go to the store, buy $5 worth of stuff. So that's what tapping does. And you can be a little more precise, you know, about doing each of the different parts of your body. So anybody have any questions so far? Does it make sense? Well, if you're injured, then neither one is effective. If you're in better shape and you can do the impact, that, that's probably going to put more, more strain and more so strength developing. Be than walking. Brisk walking is, is better as far as what we're talking about, as far as making your bones stronger. So this brings up kind of an interesting point here. Um, do you just want to have strong bones, or do you want to be healthier with strong bones? Because right now, we could do any of these things, and then we could go smoke a pack of cigarettes and go drink a bottle of wine. But guess what? If I keep doing these things, my legs are going to get stronger, my femur is going to get stronger, my back's going to get stronger. But 
I'm still smoking a pack of cigarettes a day and drinking a bottle of wine. So do we just want to get healthy bones or do we want the function of the bones to be healthy? So it makes us kind of switch over to a different board here. While you're racing, what is your opinion on the vibration for a, a 50 year old with time constraints that needs to lose weight and has it started you know, it doesn't have the time, it's taking the time to do the good thing, the vibration machines. I've, I've read for him pros and cons. Do you have access to one? He can buy one and put it in his office. So, okay, you got to buy one and then you got to use it. Most exercise equipment, after the first month or so, when people purchase it, they don't use it. Okay? So you got that issue. So if you're going to put the time in anyway, Okay, I got to do this for five minutes. Well, do the breathing for five minutes. And you're going to have less stress, and your body's going to function better too. So it's kind of like we start to decide what's better for the individual. If you have access to it and it's there, use it, right? Spend uh, $500 or thousand dollars. Maybe I wouldn't do that. Um, as far as just getting started with it, let's try a vibration exercise. Again, if you're not comfortable, then don't. Just watch. But if you're comfortable doing this and you want to stand up. What we're going to do is shake our hands. And if you can get very relaxed, so again, we're not lifting weights. I'm trying to make the weight of my hands shake my body. So from my hand shaking, I move up to my forearms, my elbows, my shoulders. Now, if we keep doing this after a few seconds, you're going to start feeling something. We'll find out at the end, right? If that's fine, let your knees bend gently. If your knees are fantastic and you have no problem, then by all means, let them bend. If they're weak, then, you know, be careful. If that's fine, we lift our heels and let them gently come down. So this would be vibration, tension, and if our heels drop too hard, it's impact. If you let them, like you can hear mine maybe, hit. All right. So picture we just got out of a pool, you forgot your towel, you're soaking wet, you're trying to get the water off of your body. This is a way to do it, right? All right, so stop and bring your hands in front, like you're holding on to a ball. Some of you might feel some tingling. You just got your energy moving, you just got your chi moving. That's an indication of what you got in your body that you might not have realized you can do. Well, we grab a seat again for a few minutes. Remember I said 80% I talk, 20% you move today. So. so if you did that every day for like a minute, maybe five minutes if you really wanted to build up to it, that would have gone back to the vibration um, category that I had over here. So back to what I was saying about do you want to have healthy bones or do you want to have healthy bodily functions? When we do just those things that I had listed, it makes the bone stronger. Doesn't necessarily make our habits change. So what I was gonna say with uh, the functions, what we just did has to do with not just your circulatory system, I'm just gonna abbreviate, but also your lymphatic system. Oop, I left out a whole bunch of letters there. Let's just say lymph. All right, so our heart beats on its own. We don't have to do much. It, it will beat, right, until it gives out. So that's our circulatory system. We'll breathe just because it's involuntary. We'll breathe most of the time with no problem. The lymphatic system needs a little help. If we don't move, stuff doesn't get pushed out of the body. So that shaking that we just did makes the, uh, the waste move out of our body more readily. And it's something you can do. It doesn't take that much time effort. You can do it while you're standing at the bank. You know? <laughs> People look at you like, wow, oh, you're really happy. It's like, they don't need to know, right? So what are you doing in the privacy of your own home? You know, it's like, it doesn't take that much. Anything that I'm showing you, though, does take effort. It's got to take some effort. It's got to take either time, effort, cost, or sacrifice of any of those things. And, you know, people that say that I've never done any of this stuff, and I've been healthy my whole life, they're usually the ones that they get to be a certain age, and then they drop over from a heart attack, and it's like, 
okay. You know, like my son, you know, he can eat 6,000 calories a day because he's on the rowing team. He's a, a college rower now. And it's like, bud, you won't be doing that when you're in your 30s and 40s because you'll have a heart attack early. But he can do it now. He can burn it off. So anyway, circulation, kind of a given. Your heart will move. It's good to keep it healthy by doing other exercises. Lymphatic system takes some effort. That's an exercise we can do to make that happen. So this brings me to, aside from the function of those, what is the real problem with our bones or our health? You know, I could probably ask each of you, you got some kind of issue. I have issues, you know, it's like you're always going to have some body problems if you're an active adult and you're aging. It's just part of the cycle. So what I have found to be the root problem of most of our issues. See, I need to do a few more breathing exercises so I can relax. So, the root problem is poor breathing habits. How does that work? Well, you know, I run a mile a day, I swim a mile, I weight train. You know, I breathe a lot, but I'm still having issues. Okay. Your breathing is something you can adjust. But most people don't even think about it. Like I said at the beginning, we breathe from about the one top third of our, our lungs. So what happens is <clears throat> we, we have thoughts, right? Everybody has thoughts. If I start talking politics right now, the conversation is going to go really far to one direction. If I start talking religion, we're going to go another direction. We have control of what we're talking about, our thoughts, right? So I'm engaging you hopefully with this stuff, which is health and you know, better breathing, make our body healthy. So we are in control of our thought. We are in control of our thoughts. Our thoughts, doing it again, directly affect our emotions. Like I said, politics is probably going to get us riled up a bit. Thinking about being at the beach, relaxing, maybe with you know, someone you care about, your spouse, your grandchildren, you know. Yeah, that's kind of peaceful, right? So your thoughts affect your emotions. Your emotions affect your blood. Yep, blood chemistry. So have you ever watched television and the news comes on and you got to turn it off because it gets you riled up, it gets you, you know, just not feeling good. So now your emotions are affected by your thoughts. And now your blood chemistry changes. So now, um, this is very important right here. I'll come back to this in a moment. Your blood chemistry affects your organs. And they're fine. Yes, I can write better if I was sitting down at a chair maybe. So our organs and our function, that comes back to your, your organs, your uh, your, your bones being healthy. You know, your bones aren't just for your structure. Your bones are your warehouse and your factory for your blood cells. So if your bones aren't that healthy, aside from being strong, you're probably going to have some issues. So what happens when we get down to here, the chemistry changes our organs. I'm going to switch over to this board. What we would like to see happen is slow breaths. Because with slow breaths, something starts to happen. What we'll do on average is breathe 12 to 18 breaths per minute throughout the day. Average. Kind of a lot. Used to be like 12 to 15, and our culture changed. You know, we're not just farmers anymore working around the house all day, you know, it's changed. So we're breathing more. This is where cortisol hangs out at. Cortisol is the chemical hormone, whatever you call it, that makes our body think that we're always kind of in stress, we're always on, like we're always alert. So we try to get to 10 breaths per minute. 
and that's what we were just doing a moment ago. What happens at 10 breaths per minute? Parasympathetic reflex. That's a big word for saying that you're trying to relax and chill. During the day, we're in the other um, thing called the sympathetic nervous system. It's where, again, we're alert and trying to function at a high level, watch every detail that's going on. So we do some breathing from Qigong or Tai Chi, gets us down to 10 beats per minute. Ideally, if we get to six beats per minute, now that's kind of like meditation or Tai Chi with slow movement, your body thinks you're asleep. And what happens is while you're asleep, all different kinds of bodily functions change. Your digestion relaxes and you digest better. Um, what else happens? Cells regenerate that are injured. Six beats per minute. You can't do it just by going to work and like being at a computer screen. It ain't going to happen. You can't do it by walking around the neighborhood. While your legs are getting stronger, you're still at six beats per minute. So what happens on a chemical level, let's come back over to this board here. Each one of your organs is affected by your thoughts. When I was younger, I'd hear people getting ulcers that I knew. Why you got ulcers? Either they drank too much alcohol, which is an issue in itself, or they had a lot of stress and they were worrying. It affects your stomach. Fear. You've heard people um, peeing in their pants because they're, they're, they're afraid. Someone gets mugged. Someone pulls a gun on them. They release, right? Um, anger affects your heart. So all these things have an effect. So again, getting our, our uh, beats per minute slow, let's just say we're getting down to 10. There's this chemical reaction that happens called dose. D is for dopamine. Hope I spell these right. That's an A. O is oxytocin. S is serotonin. Spelled that one wrong. E is endorphins. Those are the good hormones. Those are the ones we want. Those are the ones when you're watching Grey's Anatomy or whatever, they say, oh, you gotta get dopamine, you know, it makes them feel better. So um, your body produces these naturally. Cortisol is the one we don't want. And that's up here throughout the most part of our day. So if you're kind of like, say, running your air conditioner all year long, you know, it's winter time. You don't need the air conditioner on anymore at your house, but you still run the air conditioner. So what's the chances of your air conditioner lasting for 10 years? The warranty runs out at 11, right? So you run the air conditioner all day long, every day of the year, even though you don't need to. That's kind of the same idea of being up here all the time. Throughout the course of your day, why are we always so intent and so, so engaged in everything? It's got to you know, take its toll somewhere comes back to our organs. Okay, so we covered history. We got a little bit of an idea what Tai Chi is, a little bit what Qigong. We're going to actually do more of the Tai Chi exercises, so you'll see what that is firsthand. We covered um, what different types of exercises you can do to make your bones stronger. Treadmill, jump rope, tennis. Not for me, okay? Um, what did we cover here? The root problem. The root problem really is not breathing deep not breathing shallow, having too much stress. The solution is to get slower breaths so that these chemicals get released, not this one, and your body actually functions on a healthier level. Any questions? Yes? About, uh, you know, here you've got to do a lot of aerobic exercise. That gets your beats up. So maybe that's just a temporary thing though? It goes back to wanting to be physically healthy or wanting to be mentally healthy where it affects your body. So you can be doing aerobics two, three times a week, but you still got a lot of stress going on up here. You're, you're going to wonder, why am I still, you know, having stomach problems? Why do I have an ulcer? Why do I have neck pains? Because all the tension you hold in your neck from, you know, staring at the TV or computer or whatever. So I'm speaking pretty broad, you know, with a broad brush. But any type of exercise is definitely good. Find the one that you do, that you do consistently. Because if you just do the Qigong or the Tai Chi one, once a month, it's probably not going to give you much benefit. So find whatever you can do regularly. 
you know, people walk, and it's therapeutic for them. They let their thoughts kind of just dissolve away, and it's very therapeutic. Other people, they walk, and that's when they're doing their worst thinking, and they get wrapped up in it. So aerobic, you know, it's good, but on what level do you want to be at? Most of you in this group, I think, I, I don't know if I'm the youngest in here, I'm 54, um, the, the goal is to stay healthy. It's not just to be cosmetically attractive or to look, look strong or have strong legs and arms. You know, that's part. It's nice, but if the organs aren't healthy, then that's really what it comes down to. And as we get older, that's what presents itself more. You know, it's not like, you know, gee, my thigh's really been bothering me, my quadricep, you know, that's really bothering me. Or my, my bicep, you know, that's really been bothering me. No, it's like the joints that hold everything together or the organs, you know. It's like, oh, my heart's not strong or, you know, my stomach, I can't digest food properly. You know, those kind of things are really what's it's more important. Will aerobics help that? On some level. You know, any of the uh, physical type exercises, walking, running, treadmill, jump rope, a lot of it is exercising your arms and your legs. And in response to that, your heart and your lungs work more. And when you do yoga, tai chi, qigong, you're focusing on the breath. And the breath moves the organs. And then the arms and legs get healthier from this portion doing the work as opposed to these parts doing the work. So, again, it's just a different way of looking at it. So, for some of you today, you know, this is all going to be like, I don't know what he's talking about. Others, it's going to be like right on because you've already done some research on it and it makes sense. So, what I suggest for some of you that, you know, do a little searching of what you need to do for getting yourself in better shape, better health, better peace of mind, um, you're all sitting here as observers. Observe. Observe what I'm talking about. Make sense? Think about it a little bit. Contemplate. Think about this later on today, tomorrow, the next couple days. Go on the internet, go to the bookstore, get more research on some of this stuff, breathing, qigong, yoga. Um, contemplate on it a little bit. If you're really into it, you meditate on it. Meditation is another word for focused thought. For some people, that's praying. Others, it's just chilling out. Um, it's focused thought, whatever you do with it. So that process there of anything, you know, you go to buy a car. Look at the car. What are they selling you? Go home. Think about it. Is it a good deal? Sleep on it for a day or two. Your gut tells you that it's a good deal, and you go back and you buy it. So... Anyway, that's getting out there a little bit on a different subject. Why don't we try a couple more, more exercises? Everybody wants to, get, to know what this Tai Chi stuff is, right? So we do have a little issue with the room with doing drastic movements where we're going to you know, spread out a little bit. So I'm going to do kind of a small, short little set here. And just, again, try to find a little bit of space and adjust if you need to. So we already just did this arm thing, right? So we come up, we inhale. If you want to do the balance, exhale. All right. Now I'm going to grab onto a huge beach ball and spin it to the left. Then my left hand goes out to the left. When that hand goes out, my other hand comes to my navel. All right. So let's try that much again. So we're going to do like the first four or five steps to it. So with this, I come up, I inhale. Look how relaxed my arms, my shoulders just floating, and then exhale. So when I do this spinning of the ball, again, my arms and shoulders, everything is relaxed, like I'm in a pool. And then I let my left arm extend out, my other hand comes down to my navel. So this hand that's out now comes back to be on the top. So I'm holding on to the ball, I'm spinning the ball to the right now. And then, like, I'm throwing the ball to the right. All right, we're going to come back to the center. The ball's a bit smaller. I'm going to roll it down. So hopefully everybody's still breathing. You're not holding your breath. I didn't say to breathe, right? So with this, again, it's going to be inhale as I come up. Exhale as I come down. Extra credit is lift your toes for a moment and then go flat. So now when I spin the ball... I'm, going to I'm also going to shift my weight to my left hip. So my left 
arm goes with my left hip. And then I come back, equal weight, shift to the right hip as you throw the ball to the right side. Come back to the center, equal weight on both legs, and then we come down. So that's how we start to figure the balance. You know, it's like, oh, tight shoe is better for you to balance. Well, how does that work? Because you start to become familiar with where your center of gravity is at. If I say, let's just go run, you don't know where your center of gravity is at until you trip. And then you realize, oh, I don't know how my balance is. So with doing this, learning how to shift and where your weight is at, it's just one step in getting familiar with where your balance should be. So I'm going to face you this time. So my arms float up, hands relax, shoulders loose, heels up a little bit, come down flat. The very last part, toes lift up for a moment. So now we're going to go your, your, your left. I spin the ball. So really I'm pushing from my feet. My feet push, my hip moves, my hand finishes. And this hand is very loose, just like it's floating. And then I come back to the center. When my hands come back, my weight comes back to the center. Here's the ball. So now I'm going to shift towards your right as I throw that ball to the left. This other hand goes to my navel. We come back to the center. We roll the ball down. All right. So if you want to try something that's a little more difficult, stay standing up. If you don't, then either stay where you're at or grab a seat. All right. There's no big deal either way. So say we're going to branch into something a little bit more challenging with this. So I'm going to shift my weight. This foot gets to where it's just barely touching the ground. This hand, so I have that ball again, is going to come up over by my forehead, my temple. This other hand comes to my side. If that's fine, lift your leg off the ground. If that's fine, lift it up as high as it can go. If that's fine, pull your toes in next to your kneecap. Set the foot down softly. And then we're going to try the other side. So in theory, that setting the foot down gives you some impact. It's not a lot, okay? But if you do it every day, a couple times here and there, that, that's the impact. This side is the tension. When I did this, that's a minimal amount of tension, all right? So there's different levels of how much tension we can put. So now I have to do the other side. So I shift over to here. This right foot is just barely touching. I spin the ball, this hand comes up to my temple, this hand comes down towards my hip. If that's all fine, I let this hip sink down, because the lower my center of gravity is, the easier it will be to balance. Try to lift the foot off the ground. If you can get it up, you get up higher. If you can get it up high, you go as high as you can. High as you can, then it's pull your foot next to your kneecap. Set it down softly. All right, so that gave you a little bit of an example of tension, minimal impact, but now balance. Oh, wow, how's that work? We'll come back to that in a moment. So this thing we did a moment ago with this. This time when I come down, I'm going to bring my hips back. If you lean over a little bit, that's fine. Try to move from the hips. Straighten up, let your arms come down. So what we don't want to do is move from our knees and get the knees way over our toes where this weight and the center of gravity is going to put strain on the knee joint. I'm going to keep my hips back. Just like if I was going to go sit in a chair. See where my hips end up so far behind? That's the goal without the chair. So again, I'm about shoulder width. I lift up. We don't need to do the balance part on our ball of our feet. But when we come down, bring your hips back, slow slowly back up and the arms can drop as we straighten up so doing one time some of you're gonna feel that right say we want to do like five of them okay now it's an exercise program <laughs> you know it'll take you about a minute or two to do five of them I don't need to go to the health club and stand on a vibration thing for an hour I can do this for five minutes and this will be challenging so my arms come up hips go back slowly down slowly back up. 
That's an exercise that will make your thighs and your knees get stronger. If you try to keep your back straight, it starts working on your back strength. There's all kinds of other things going on. Maybe your heart's beating a little bit more. Why doesn't everybody grab a seat for a moment? And I can demonstrate a few other things that we do. With any one class that I teach, we cover a variety of different things because everybody's different. Some people, you know, like I said, your back hurts for this exercise, your knee hurts for that one. I give you a variety. It's like, oh, I'm not going to do that one, but I'll do the next one. And then every month, I change up what we're doing also. So some months might be a little more aggressive on, say, balance. Another month, you know, it's a little more on strength. Another one might be just, oh. That's saying we got five minutes left, and I should ask if anybody wants to ask questions. So um, just to finish the thought of what I was saying. So every month, I do a different set of exercises. The actual Tai Chi set we did, we did like the first two steps. There's 108 exercises. I've never taught 108 of the exercises because we run out of time that month. Next month comes, we shift to something different. So I have done this stuff with the group with you know, tapping the body. Again, we'll do it for a month, and we'll switch on to something else. So is anybody here into the whole weight training aspect of, of, of exercise? Anybody go to the gym and do weight training? Little weights are great. You know, really, you don't need to use heavy weights. These weigh about two pounds. So some exercises that I do with this would be similar to what we just tried to do, going down slowly. So I might try to keep my back somewhat straighter. Thanks for coming. So that would be one exercise. Another one would be turning slowly. And sinking down. Now, granted, each one of these is a very deep inhalation, exhalation. Are you taking a few pictures? Can you do me a favor? Take a picture of the whole like group from just okay. yeah, just so everybody can see. You know, a bunch of people did show up. So, so <laughs> see, I do these things. I tell people, and they're like, "Does anybody like your interest in this stuff?" It's like, well, yeah. So you can see I can get a little more contortionist like with the yoga stances and that. But okay, my background on this is all like from the martial end. And then I learned the health benefits thereafter. And then I studied um, traditional Chinese medicine, anatomy, kinesiology. I studied these things in response to what I learned. So if you're kind of into this, like, OK, I just want to go run and get my heart beating, then this stuff might not be your pace. But if you're like really into it, it's like, you know, I want to know why my neck hurts. Like, why does it hurt? And it's not just because it's tight. And you want to learn more about it. That's what a lot of this type of stuff is. It's like, what do you just do? You know, I twisted my hips. So this is strength in the lower body for my legs, which bone strength. It's twisting my hips, circulation in the, it's called a qua, where your hip meets the torso, Circul main circulation point to your legs, right? And then my organs, my lower uh, intestines are getting twisted. This, my neck, my shoulder, my spine, back muscles, you know? So anyway, you can definitely take it to other levels with doing so this is some weight training, kind of like weird. You know, it's not like what I call weight training. I could do the same thing with dumbbells, but I brought these instead. And then there's another set that we worked on last month was here. Not everybody goes as low as I do. Notice I do these slow up and down with the hips. So it's not just building strength low. We want to have strength throughout that whole range of motion. So these are weight exercises, but look at the amount of weight I'm using. It's like stretching with a little bit of resistance. So that will get my heart beating more. I can feel it. But at the same time, I can feel my, my breaths lower, so it's relaxing, even though there's tension. It's very contradictory to what most people think. If they're not soaking wet, breaking a sweat, all red, they don't think they're getting exercise. 
So, any questions? Because we're running out of time. Can you demonstrate a lymphatic exercise? That's the best one. Because it's quick and easy. It doesn't take much to memorize. Or, like you're flicking the water at the wall. Anything where it's kind of shaking or vibrating. You know, in general, if you're moving and exercising, the lymph is going to move better than sitting. But that kind of flicking without hurting the body is really good for getting it. Just think if you had water on your body. This, some people have been taught, have lymph issues, lymph cancer, breast cancer, the dry brushing type stuff. It's the same idea. If you had water on your body, be flicking it off. That helps get the circulation of the lymph. You're doing a shower, too. Because you're showering, you're going to do it anyway, right? I'm a little concerned about some of the twisting stuff that you advised in last year's class. Oh. Yes, yes. So if you take your class, are you aware of kinds of the things that you should have Well, with my follow along class, which is anywhere from 10 to 15 people that come to it, I do not touch or adjust anybody. For that fact, I don't turn around and say, you should be doing it this way or that way. It's follow along to the best of your ability with what you're comfortable with. If you have a question on something afterwards, you say, Jim, you know, can I twist more? Excuse me, can I bend more or whatever? Then, you know, I'd tell you that personally. But no, I don't make everybody do it. I give you, okay, we're here. If you can do this, that's good. If you can do this, that's next. That's next. We're here, that's next. Maybe here, maybe there. That, that's, that's like a full range. That's a lot. You know, so I wouldn't expect you to do the whole thing right off the shot. Maybe just you do this a couple times after a couple weeks. You're like, yeah, that's fine. My body's good with that. Next time you try the leg behind. And that's just one exercise for an example. What were you going to say? Yeah, so if we feel like it, when we're doing the exercise, if we feel okay doing it, and we don't feel okay doing it, we're not going to harm ourselves? Um, well, you, again, have, you, you have that bandwidth or that spectrum, again, to go from one end of the extreme to the other. So to go back to the example, if we were playing tennis, it's like, you got to run and hit the ball. It's not like I say, run and hit the ball lightly, and, well, it already came by, you know, you didn't get it. So with this, it's like, there's always a gradual progression, and you'll start to feel for yourself and become more self-aware. So much of our day, we're doing this. Right now, you're doing this. You're looking at what I'm presenting. When we start to do the class, there's more of an emphasis on you feeling and looking at yourself. You're like, that feels good. Okay. Or you do something else. It's like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't feel good. So I'm not making you do it. For the most part, the amount of tension you're going to put on your body at any time isn't going to be that drastic. You know? I'm not going to start off and say, okay, everybody that can do this, let's go down to here. I, would, I wouldn't start you with that. I'd say, okay, let's do a horse stance. Let's start here. And then as you continue to come, um, you would start to get an understanding of what your body limits are. Everybody's got to know their limits. You heard that before, right? I do it. The class down the street is on Mondays and Fridays from 11.30 to 12.30. That's the time I've been doing it forever. That's the group that comes. I do teach privately in my neighborhood in Longwood where I've made arrangements to meet up with people and teach them privately in small groups off-site and things like that. Um, two days a week is really kind of a minimum, you know, just to start to get some benefits from doing this. And if you're, you know, pick it up and do it on your own. Five minutes a day just doing anything is, is better than not doing it. So the other thing I had um, fallen off track from earlier was the benefits of doing these exercises. It isn't just to make your bones stronger. That's part of the goal, you know, not to get osteoporosis or other issues that, you know, you don't want to get any kind of ailment, right? But if your body balance is better, chances are you're not going to fall as much. And then you're not going to have to deal with the issues that happen once you fall. Wrist issues, hip issues, inactivity issues now that you've injured yourself. Flexibility. Okay. See, I can write a little bit neater. Um, your flexibility is going to get better, your range of motion, which means that you'll have a better chance of catching yourself if you, if you are to fall. All right? Strength. Obviously, that's connected to everything we've done. Stress relief. 
That's the key. That's really the key, you know, the breathing. If you were just to do that, you would be so much more at ease and probably healthier for it. And then that opens up the door for you to do these exercises. You know, some people would do this and they look at me and they go, it's too much work, it's too stressful. Okay, you know, well, you're going to pay for it one way or another, whether in time, effort, or going to the doctor. So anyway, if you have any other questions, I think stay after for a minute or two or whatever, otherwise we've got to wrap it up. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope I didn't, uh, you know, throw you off track too much. So. Oh, thank you. Jim, in the beginning when I showed him that article, he said, you know, so much of it that matters with the martial arts and the Tai Chi is the stress. And I hadn't thought about that. And that another reason that we fall, and I can think of myself, is if we're in a hurry and we're stressed. So it really does incorporate a whole other level of exercise. So thank you. You know one of the number one reasons people get injured is they get older with falls? It's because of their pets. Their pets. They're right. chasing after their pets or trying to restrain their pets or trying to keep them from getting involved with another pet. So, yeah, you know, right. you can look it up, but that, there's research shows how all this stuff comes together. So. Yep, chase after your doggy and you trip. So.